All right. I just want to say thank you. I want to thank you for your input. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can tell that we're redoing the studio. We're redoing the studio based on the feedback that you gave us at our 300th episode uh, form that we sent out there. And we appreciate that. For those of you who are participating in our Clip Notes referral program, thank you as well. Gosh, that is, uh, it's off to a, a great start. And we appreciate that. For those of you who don't know what Clip Notes is, uh, Clip Notes is something that you helped us design again with your feedback. You said, look, I can't watch every episode, but I wanted what was going on. I want to know who was on the show. I want to know the key moments. And I want uh, some of the key moments in video format that I can just click on and watch. And we created that email that goes out to you 24 hours after each episode is released. And uh, it's our fastest growing email list. And now we have a, a referral program for that. And you guys have taken to that and it's been fantastic. It's really easy to participate. But first, before I tell you how to participate, let me tell you the great prizes that we've put out there. The first is that if you get a single referral, that you're gonna be entered in a drawing and we're gonna have the drawing on January 1st, 2021. And we're gonna be giving away a work from home kit from This Week in Health IT. If you get up to 10 referrals, you're gonna get one of these black moleskin notebooks. I've talked about them a bunch on the show. I love these things. I keep notes. I've always kept notes in these and uh, they're fantastic. It has This Week in Health IT embossed on there and it is always right next to me. And the grand prize winner, gets the opportunity to replace Drex to Ford for one week on the show and discuss Health IT News, the Tuesday Newsday show. It's gonna be you and me talking the news. You're gonna have that opportunity. You don't have to do it, but we're gonna give you the opportunity to come on the show. And I think you're gonna to wanna to do it. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We always have fun taping the show and talking about the issues that are gonna impact Health IT. So uh, that's what you can win. Let me tell you how easy it is to participate. When people sign up, there's a fourth field now that says referred by, and they just need to put in your email address. Anybody who puts in your email address in that field, you will get credit for them as a uh, referral. Send that email out, send the send a copy of Clip Notes out and say, hey, I'm subscribed to this thing. It's been great for me. You should sign up as well. They can do that in a couple of ways. They can hit the website and just hit subscribe and they can put uh, the information in there. Make sure they put your name in there for uh, the referral. They could also send an email to clipnotes at thisweekinhealthit.com. Just an email, it doesn't have to say anything. It kicks off an automated workflow. They'll get something back. They click on that and then they sign up that way. So we've made it as easy as possible to sign up. And, and you guys, it's our fastest growing email list. It's been f fantastic. We wanna get this into the hands of as many health IT practitioners as possible. And uh, we wanna thank you for making that a possibility. Now, on to the show. Welcome to This Week in Health IT, where we amplify great thinking to propel healthcare forward. My name is Bill Russell, former healthcare CIO coach, consultant, and creator of This Week in Health IT, a set of podcasts, videos, and collaboration events dedicated to developing the next generation of health leaders. I want to thank Sirius Healthcare for supporting the mission of our show to develop the next generation of health leaders. Their weekly support of the show this year has allowed us to expand our offerings and develop new services for the community. Special thanks again to Sirius Healthcare. All right, I'm excited. Today, we're going to take a look at the impact of COVID on health IT and really the leadership ramifications for that and our leadership response to that. And today, I have two great guests, former guests of the show, Sue Shade and David Muntz, principals at Starbridge Advisors. Good morning. Welcome back to the show. Morning, Bill. Morning, Good David. Morning. Good morning. Glad to be here. And Sue is in Sue Shade Red, and you're sporting some new artwork behind you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Did you notice that? I yeah. have a fabulous new piece of RBG art I bought at a silent auction for the Women's Fund of Rhode Island. Yep. Was that a local artist or is it? Yes, a it's a local. It's a local artist. It's a digital image that they did. And when I saw that, I'm like, OK, I'll bid. And then I watched until the end and I was still the top bidder. So. <laughs> yeah, those, those those bidding things make people, you go to this really fancy thing and people get dressed up and they look all civilized until the bidding starts and then people are <laughs> hovering around and anyway, it's just, it's fun. But no, that's great. That's fantastic. And I'm glad you're in Sushade Red. So it means we're ready to talk about health. It just, 
gets me going there. It gets me fired up. It's been, it's, it's actually been a while since we spoke. And I guess I, I want to start with a pretty broad question, which is what are you guys finding out there? What are you finding in your practice and what's going on in health IT? First off, I just want to thank you again for doing this with us and what a, and, and tell you what a great uh, service you are doing to the industry. I have listened to so many of your podcasts over the last six months and your field report series. And I am in awe and great respect for all the CIOs and their teams and everything they've been doing during this period. I think what we're seeing is business slowed down because people focused on COVID. That's what they needed to do. As business picked up and we got more calls, we're hearing people who still have their strategic initiatives and priorities on the agenda that they can start focusing on again. And in some respects, those are, are varying, yet there's some common themes, digital health being one of them, new ERP replacement systems being another, obviously, along with, we're seeing an uptick in coaching, more people calling and looking for coaching. And we can talk more about that a little bit later, but it really varies what people are looking for as they get, it's hard to say get past COVID when you see what's happening this fall, but as hospitals get back a bit to what else do we need to be focusing on and looking ahead to the future. Those are the kinds of calls that we're starting to, to get from people. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thanks for the kind words, by the way. Uh, I appreciate it. And, and, and everybody who's come on the show, is, they've just shared so much. Yeah. You know, I, we responded instinctually to COVID and, and did some amazing work, work. And I think, to, and we'll talk about this a little bit as well. I think to a certain extent, that's raised the expectations on health IT, which is absolutely. something that leadership's got to deal with. David, what, what are you finding? Yeah, <clears throat> what I've found is that and by the way, I'm, I would repeat what Sue said, but she said it eloquently, and we're very appreciative to what you give back. So I thank you for that, and we all are very much appreciative. And one of the things that you do is you're helping with the education process and you're sharing solutions. And one of the things that I point out when I talk about vendors is the communities that they have, but you created your own community that's been fantastic. And I think that's one of the great places that builds trust. And with that trust, we talk about everything moves at the speed of trust. And so the ability to share those solutions is huge. Fantastic. So that's our show for this week. Let me go ahead and tell you what I've, I have found and what I, what's an interesting missed opportunity. I think uh, a lot of CIOs are missing out on. They have performed heroically and overused nowadays, but it's because there are so many opportunities to be a hero. And IT has done things that we have never seen done it before at a pace that's never been imagined. And when you talk about it's the deployment of the technology or it's the expansion of the beds or it's the expansion of the services, it's really been extraordinary. And the CIOs and their teams, we know it's always a team effort, have built political capital and they're unaware of it. I don't think they appreciate the gratitude that exists out in the community for what they've done. And so they have to be careful now not to try to go back to the pre-COVID world. Uh, the idea is use the political capital that you have to create a new roadmap for the future and focus on how you're going to take advantage of the political capital that you've built. Now, you've got to balance that with expectations that, oh gosh, if you could do this so quickly, how can we do all these other things? And so as we get down the conversation about what we're advising clients, I'm happy to talk about that as well. But I do think uh, that we now see the greatest opportunity-rich environment for IT I've ever seen. So I'm very optimistic about a much, not new normal, because I don't like the, the idea of using the word normal again, but a much brighter future. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because we... The I've heard it talked about so many times of we need a seat at the table. COVID absolutely invited IT to the table. We were in in those uh, rooms where we were doing the prep. We were doing the escalation rooms. We were in we were in executive leadership. So there is that visibility. And I know in my work, I'm I'm talking to uh, COOs and others, and they're incredibly uh, appreciative of what IT has done, and they're. Some are actually amazed. They're like, I, I knew we were throwing money at them. I didn't know they'd be able to respond this way. And it's pretty, pretty interesting. But before we get too far, 
I realize I've had you guys on the show a bunch of times, so but we haven't really talked about Starbridge and what you guys do. And it'll probably give people context for the things we're talking about and the, the type of work you're doing. Sue, can you give us a little context on Starbridge? Sure, sure. So Starbridge Advisors is a health IT advisory firm. We've actually been around now for four years. We had our fourth birthday or anniversary, whatever you want to call it, what, two weeks ago? And our focus is on providing interim management at all the senior health IT leadership levels doing IT consulting and advisory services on a range of areas, really, in terms of our expertise and leadership coaching. We've got over 40 advisors who uh, are on the team. They're at that senior level for the most part as CIO, CTO, CISO, CMIO, CNIO, VP of apps. And they're available to do interim work or as I said, a range of advisory work. I think what differentiates us in the market because you there's a lot of consulting firms out there you can call. We're small, we're nimble, we've been there, we've done it. So we've sat in the seats and we come in for relatively short engagements and help out CIOs and their teams and are just very honest with our feedback and our approach, again, because we've been there, done it. So that's the long and short on us. I don't know if David wants to add anything to that. Perfect. Well, and, we, and we've had a, so we've had a fair number of your advisors on. They're experts in uh, specific fields. Amy Manneker was just on. We talked on usability. Nancy Beal was on. We had Terry, I always struggle with his last name, Ziemniak, who's a security, does right. some security projects for you. I think we've had others. I just... Rich Pollock, maybe? Rich Pollock as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a lot of people who have been there, done that, a lot of expertise in, in some core fields. Let's, so let's focus in on, on the health IT space right now. What's the number one thing that you are uh, communicating to, to your clients and to leaders and what areas are they finding uh, the most need right now? So you want to jump in? Sure. So in, in ter- I don't think there's any one specific area. And in terms of what we're communicating, I'll tell you, and Bill, you and I have had conversations like this over the years. It's all about relationships. If people know us and they know what we're capable of doing, when the need arises, we're going to get the call. And I've talked to people in the recent period who want help with security assessments, with cloud strategy, with their enterprise data strategy, analytics, digital health. ERP evaluation as they focus on that, just really a lot of different areas. And I think one of the things that I know I'm trying to emphasize when I talk to CIO is we can be flexible. I know budgets are constrained right now. So sorry. And there's the clients reaching out right now as we speak. <laughs> I don't recognize the number. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, it's either spam or yeah, someone that uh, needs us. Sorry about that. What I emphasize is that we can be flexible. I know budgets are tight. So if you have a need, you want to bring us in, you want to bring us in some reduced way just to get some initial work done. We're just, we're willing to be flexible and and go wherever they need us to go. Yeah. Yeah, What I'm telling people is conversations with me are free, right? So if you just want to call and have a conversation, Hey, how are things going? How can we help? Or just talk about how I've addressed that problem or how people in our organization have addressed it. That's, we have those conversations five times a week, but when it, when it turns into, Hey, can you do something for me? That's when it turns into a project. But, and you guys are doing a lot of that, allowing people to reach out and tap into your expertise. I think that's an excellent point. I do those calls too. And when someone says, this has been really a good call, let's talk again in three months. And we just schedule more time. They might want me to be a sounding board on something. And like you say, if it turns into more then we try to shape that. Can I go ahead and just expound on one thing that you talked about, what's going on in the health IT space. And right now the budget and the constraints, and this is what you talked about, Sue, are huge. And yet they're not misplaced. That's an appropriate thing to do. On the other hand, the thing you don't want to do is ignore the revenue opportunities uh, that exist out there and new ways to deliver care. And in a telehealth is a great example. And just last week, CMS approved 11 new coverages for telehealth uh, care. And so it's expanding. And you know we just have to figure out far better ways to do things. I think one of the things that 
I see that we are going to have to talk about to the people as we develop this new brighter future is change management. We, we have to go back to the really basic thing because the way that we're going to conduct business going forward is not going to be the way that we're going to conduct business or deliver care going forward. The hospital at home is a term that we hear a lot, but my wife happens to be a hospice nurse and she says, you know, that's a 70 year old concept. And she's been doing acute care in the home for a long time, but with the ability to extend the technology and to do things that are that were very challenging before, because you didn't have the connection back to the to the physician. Anyway, it creates an, an entirely different approach. So I think the key is to try to balance how much you're gonna try to take out of IT versus how much you're gonna invest in IT in order to get the revenues in the other place. And what I see, and this is one of the again big opportunity for CIOs is to change the way that people think about them. And you were referencing this, Bill, talking about want to get a seat at the table. I've always had a seat at the table, but I, one of my former employee, employers, when something would break, I would always be the technology guy who would go up and fix it, the AV guy that I used to be in high school. When I went to my second employer, I recognized that I didn't want to be looked at as the technology guy. So when something would break in the room, They'd look at me and I'd go, let me call the help desk and field services and get them over there. So the idea is part of the change management is to change the image that you have now as the technology person and come in as the business person who knows how to work with the technology to get it installed and get it in place. And I think COVID has shown or given us the opportunity to do that because I think a lot of CIOs are trying to pivot from just technology now to focus on business. And that's a great opportunity. You know, I I had two conversations in the past week, which were interesting. One, we were talking about the influx of people from the outside. So you have Novad hired somebody from the outside. You have Common Spirit hired somebody from the outside. And I just had heard of another one, which is a pretty significant organization that hired somebody from the outside. And, And actually both of those other organizations are significant organizations as well, where they are they're bringing people in. And I think part of it is what you just described. It's they're looking for the business IT person that's going to sit down and talk about transforming the business and those things. And I find that that conversation in of itself is interesting. And then I had another conversation with a pretty high up leader within a health organization. And they were saying essentially that, you know, hey, the CIO is really excellent tactically running the business of IT, but we're not, basically what they're saying is I'm not sure they're ready to be the strategy person, the the person who's looking five years out and being the strategy person. I sat back and I thought, I wonder if that distinction is going on all over the place and CIOs are trying to figure out how do I get positioned as a strategy person within it, within an organization and organizations are saying, Hey, who's going to fill this void of really the digital strategy. And so you mentioned digital as one of the, one of the areas that people are looking at, how are you coaching CIOs in that area? How are you helping them to, to start to think digital, to think business and to, to get out in front of it? Yeah. You want to take it? You want me to take it? Yeah. No, I'll go ahead and jump in. One of the things, Bill, that I'm trying to do is to try. I know that sounds silly. It's, what's in a name? That's an important question to answer. And I've suggested that all the people that I'm talking to change the term, get IT or information services out of the name and use the term digital services going forward. And the whole point is to try to take ownership of the digital strategy. And too often people conflate the word consumerism and thinking that consumerism and digital health are the same thing. And they're so radically different. Digital services sits over digital health and consumerism is just a small part and the reason that people are going outside to look for those CIOs from uh, consumer oriented organizations is because they do the two together and so it's really critical that you come up with a strategy that gives people a much broader understanding of what digital health is, what it means to be a digital health system and the idea is you want a digital experience, but there's got to be that analog human part of it. And so I appreciate that there are many smart people outside of healthcare who can bring a lot of creativity and innovation analytics in, but this deep understanding of healthcare and what it means in terms of analog versus digital 
is together. And so a digital health system needs to figure out how to put both the analog and digital together in a way that's going to give her give care that's both high tech. And that's a tried, kind of a tried term. That's something that really is important. And I see that element of analog missing the, the need for di digital going too far. And the other thing is, and I don't want to get too much on a social soapbox, but there is a digital divide that exists in the country. And um, I live in Austin and access to connections is really important. And yet in many of the underserved communities here, there's not a digital connection. So if you look at just digital as the approach without including that analog part, you're going to miss a huge part of the population than the one who consumes more healthcare than anybody else. And so that conversation needs to be changed. And by the way, what they did here in Austin is they put Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi connections into school buses and drove them to the underserved communities, which worked for a while. But now that school is taking back, coming back into place, the buses are no longer available. Digital health has to look across the digital divide. And there are ways to do that because <clears throat> there is nobody I know, and I'm sure there are some exceptions to this, who doesn't have at least a digital thumb. Uh, and so when you're designing fancy systems, <clears throat> text only has to be a, an option. And it's our obligation to cover not just the digitally sophisticated, but the digitally incapable as well. It's, it's, it's interesting. Sue? Yeah, if I can just build on, if I can just build on the, the, the point about what are we advising CIOs at this point, there's no one size fits all. If I'm talking to a CIO and they're struggling with how to expand their role versus the organization's already decided they're bringing in a chief digital officer and where do they fit in that? It's, it's where are they at? What do they want to be doing? How comfortable are they with that expanded role? Where's the organization at? Where are they in relationship to the executive team and what they're able to bring forward? So it's really trying to understand their situation and advise them because I don't think it's one size fits all. Not every organization is approaching this in the same way. So you see all sorts of models at this point in terms of CIOs and expanding roles. The other thing I want to just make a plug as we talk about digital health, David has done really an excellent, are we at four part or five part? Soon to be five We're part. Four, waiting for five next week. Series, blog series on the Starbridge mm -hmm. Advisors blog, View from the Bridge on Digital Health. It's worth checking out. Absolutely, I, I saw you. So what, what are some of the topics on that? You did, uh, you did governance. I think that's one of the places you started. What what other topics have you covered on, uh, on digital? The most recent one was, I think, language. I get mixed up because there's so many of them, but it's, you know, what does it mean to be a digital health system? How do you get there? The governance associated with it. But there are so many areas, and this is such a such an interesting fabric as you put together your plans. So I'm very hopeful that people will uh, take take on the responsibility of being a digital health officer without having to have a separate digital health officer. In the CIO role, I like to see transform to become digital health services CIO type. We, I wanted to touch on this with you guys because I think you have a lot of uh, experience with your clients around this. We saw an uptick of ERP work just prior to COVID and it was, hey, we did all the clinical work, we did all the, all the EHR work for the last decade and we let our ERP systems atrophy. It's probably the best word for it. And uh, we saw that those projects kick off pre-COVID. Have they started to, to resume? Are we starting to see that work come back? We are. Significantly. And when I talk about the expense reduction, one of the ripest for it is supply chain management. And you read articles. I read one today talking about how the revenue managing, I'm sorry, how to manage the supplies increases the amount of cash that's available to an organization. And you know, it's really difficult to do that with the old kind of disconnected, ignored systems. And so people are rushing toward ERPs and we have developed a very good set of tools that will help us choose this. There's not one of those 40 people that we have that hasn't been through multiple implementations of ERPs, um, both in the past and in the present. And it's astonishing what a different kind of experience the new ERP is for the employees and the staff. And there is, the fact is that it's to 
and state the obvious, human capital management, supply chain management, and financial management. And human capital management touches every single employee in the enterprise and often uh, has to reach over and take care of the providers as well who are sometimes employed. The impact of those can't be understated. And the enthusiasm is great. The, the selection of those tools to me has always been fascinating because you just touched on finance and human capital. And so you're bringing those teams together to do a, an RFP process. And I, I don't know about you guys, but it has felt to me like there's a lot of give and take in the, in that selection process. Cause either one does the human capital really well and the finance. Okay or they do the finance really well. And the human capital is like just a module that's bolted onto it. And so in some senses, somebody's walking away, not really happy with the decision. Is, is that what you're finding or are or, or tools starting to get really start to bridge that divide? Uh, let me, I think the tools are evolving and, and bridging that. But if I talk about it from a a buyer's perspective and organization that we are working with now, we just finished the ERP selection. It was great to see the collaboration between the domain leads and the recognition that, you know, in the end, the product that they were going to go with had strengths in some areas and not as much in others, but for the greater good of the organization and an integrated single solution, they were okay to move forward. So I think what you're seeing is, in that whole space, a similar process and decision-making as you saw with the EHRs. There's give and take. Some areas might be strong, some areas might be weak, but if we're committed as an organization to go with a single integrated solution, then this is what we're gonna do. Yeah, and I think that's perfect. And one of the things I would say is one of the other trends we're seeing is instead of operating as a loose confederation of facilities, now, systemness has become something everybody embraces, and we see great embrace of that. It's not like one group does and one group doesn't. Every single interview that we did with all the leaders in all the areas said the same thing without knowing what it, the other was going to say. And so um, wanting to function as a team has now become the norm, not something you really have to fight for. And as you're doing change management, knowing that you want to operate collaboratively really changes the enthusiasm around change management. So we saw huge telehealth gains. What, what's the CIO's role in telehealth, do you feel, moving forward? Sue, you're coaching and talking to a lot of people. Is the CIO role just the technology foundation or are they part of a, and if they're part of a larger team, who else is in that team that's really determining the, the direction of telehealth? So, so what I would say is it's amazing how organizations were able to scale quickly with telehealth. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you can hear me okay? Okay. Because they had the foundation in place, though they were doing small numbers. And it was really about adoption and workflow with the clinicians. I think the technology is there. And I think that the role of the CIO to really make it stick at this point is probably very much connected to the work of the CMIO, as well as the, the ambulatory leaders and the patient experience leaders to make sure that those workflows and access, workflows for the clinicians and the patient, and the access is there in a seamless way. So people want to continue to do it. It's easy. It's convenient versus, okay, we did that because of COVID, but now we're going to go back to the office. The word I heard the most during COVID was focus, right? In, in IT, it's like we, we were focusing on three things, get people to work from home, stand up telehealth and security, making sure that there, there was no gaps during that process. It was like heads down focus. Uh, it, are we going to be, is that one of the roles of the CIO at this point is to try to maintain some of that focus around telehealth to say, look, there's a great opportunity here. And we've done a lot of really great work to, that we can build on. Is, is their role as a champion of sustaining the telehealth gains? Yeah, I think so. And it also depends within the organization, is telehealth totally their purview or is it off somewhere with a, a chief digital officer that they're partnering with or a whole separate telehealth area? But can I key in on another point you just made that's not telehealth and that's focus? When... As I listened to all the field report series, what people said over and over again, we were able to get things done in a matter of days, not 
months, years, and it had to do with focus. It had to do with decision-making, quick decision-making. And we all know the painful decision-making in organizations, right? So I think regardless of the project and the initiative, those are some of the really important things that CIOs and, and healthcare organization leaders really need to make stick, that you can focus because you can easily get on way too many projects and none of them are going as fast as you want them to. And then that, deci- that rapid decision-making. Yeah, can I jump on that one too? Because to me, focus is, requires better governance or more focus on if you will, to use the word. And that has become really apparent. And getting the CMO involved as well is really important because I have seen the champions for telehealth move to other places, but the technology still is a requirement in the, making sure that the work process is done. And I used to say something that sounds like what a high school coach would say, especially if you're from Texas, but the idea is we can do anything, we can't do everything. And right now, the demand for everything is back on the burner again. It's like, well, you did all this in such a short period of time. I'm going to turn up demand back on the request uh, queue. And again, good governance, getting everybody represented well is really important, multidisciplinary and inter in And anyway, I think that's the most critical part right now. All right. I'm going to get everybody some free coaching here. So the three of us are going to take turns on this. Then we're going to act as a coach. I'm going to give three different categories as we move through. Let's start with academic medical centers. So we've all done work for or been a part of academic medical centers. If you're talking to an an AMC CIO right now, what's one piece of coaching that you would give them? And David, we'll start with you. Um, Certainly. Politics. People always say they hate politics. And if you hate politics, you're not going to be a successful CIO. And the idea is to make sure that you are seen as the peacemaker and that you figure out how to get people to do the things they don't want to do. And that takes some finesse and a bulldog approach. And I've seen the political approach, and I think the political approach is far more important. So it's not to ignore the, the politics or try to increase it, but to try to use it for the appropriate reasons. Sue, AMC CIO, what are you telling them these days? That's a great question. I'm going to take it from the angle of AMCs that are closely affiliated with or part of potentially a university system. And I think you see a lot of different models there in terms of separate CIOs or combined CIOs or the university taking over. And again, it's looking at where's your organization at? What's the politics of your organization? And doing the integration and shared services where it makes sense, but never losing sight of the primary focus that the health delivery system within that overall ecosystem has to deliver care to patients. And it's very different than the university side of that equation, if you will. Yeah. If I were coaching an AMC CIO right now, I would say make a list of of 10 ways that your AMC could start generating revenue. David, getting back to what you said earlier, uh, I think AMCs have a unique opportunity right now. I saw that Southwest named Stanford as their partner in determining what their policies were for go back to work and those kind of things. And I think those, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what, uh, first of all, the brand, the recognition, the research, the, the tie with, there's just so many opportunities. So that's where I would go. Okay. We're going to go second category and Sue, we'll go, we'll go to you and I'll lead off the third one. But, I've never been on a game show. <laughs> I, you, but you, I keep, I keep doing this to you guys. So the, <laughs> the second one is, you know, let, let's just call it a medium sized IDN, maybe, maybe 10 hospitals. That's a big, that's fairly sizable. Let's say six hospitals serving a region, middle market region, and maybe even one of the primary providers in their state. What are you saying to that kind of CIO? They have a decent size organization, a decent size budget, probably not enough, and but they have a decent size and they have a good market share. So what are you saying to that CIO? Is there a particular problem they're trying to solve? So that that's where you would start is what's the challenge? I, I think, based, if I may, based on the profile and the size of the organization you just defined, they may well be looking for partners 
within that region. And if there's merger and acquisition activity going on, the CIO has got to be front and center and part of that team looking carefully at that. And maybe they're looking at how they can help increase revenue and bring value to the growth of that organization in that market short of a, a, a merger. Yeah. I, the, so the middle size, the middle size IDN, I, I think these are the CIOs that are struggling to step up as digital leaders. They're really good. I have clinical informatics. The, the, the EHR is probably functioning really well. They, they probably have a decent IT team. The systems don't go down. Good vendor, decent vendor management and those kind of things. And I think the next step for them is to step into this digital side and the organization saying, okay, look, we, we got it. The EHR is functioning and we pack systems run and we can share information across our network. This is great. What's next? I'd, I'd like to, I, I would like to encourage them to start to step into that by creating, you know, a digital roadmap, create a digital roadmap and share it with a couple of people and see, get some feedback and, and be the, the, the cheerleader, if you will, on that. David, where, where would you take the, the middle market CIO? Yeah, one of the, and I know this is going to be an unpopular opinion, but the fact is I do believe that much of IT has reached commodity status. Mm-hmm. And so if you want to have focus, if you want to be seen as a business leader, you should think about some source of selective outsourcing in order to make sure that somebody else can have the headaches that are associated with keeping the lights on so that you can focus on the things that are more creative and innovative. And there are, it's possible by managed services to replace small portions of it. In my whole career, I did selective outsourcing and found it to be very popular or very effective. And I was always asked by my CEO to, can we outsource you? So I would always go out and say, let's try to outsource the whole shop and always was able to prove that we could do it cheaper, but there were portions of the organization that could do it better outside. And so I think that uh, looking at managed services is the smart thing for people to do in those middle markets in order to enable them to do exactly what you two said. Yeah. So the last group I'm going to give you is the rural health system. And we all know this, these are the people I have so much empathy for because they're small organizations serving, sometimes serving larger ge- geographic areas than some of the significant health systems that we're used to dealing with. Plus, I think this is also one of the loneliest jobs in the world in that there isn't a potentially a strong peer network for them to bounce ideas off of. And these could be people with 10 people on their IT staff. I've heard one of that had five people on their IT staff. And, and that just boggles my mind when you think about the regulatory challenges, the clinical informatics, the reporting, all those things. And I, and I think what I'm saying to that group is, gosh, again, I, I would start with empathy and I'm not sure I'd get past it, but it would be try to make as much of your budget uh, fixed as possible. And I know that's the opposite of what I would tell some of the larger health systems, but the reason I tell the smaller health systems to fix their budget like a certain amount to a vendor for, for analytics or something to that effect is because when the, the, your health system goes up and down with the economy and you want to keep people from cutting things that they just shouldn't cut. And, and one of the ways to do that is to have a three-year agreement or a five-year agreement so that they don't come in and go, Hey, we need to cut, we need you to cut back on security, but well, we can't cut back on security. We can't cut back on any, you can't cut back on any of that stuff. So to a certain extent, I would, I think I'd coach them to make that fix. And I don't know if that's good advice or not. Let's see who goes second on this one. David, you go second on this one. What, what are you telling the rural CIO at this point? Actually, I can give you some anecdotal evidence because I'm working with a 15 general access hospital. And it's essentially what you said, you have to outsource and what you do, they don't have a, an IT staff. They have, you know, three people essentially taking care of things. And the nice thing about, and by the way, I, I came up in a smaller hospital and worked with rural facilities in the large systems. The thing that's nice about that is that people there know everything and there's so few handoffs. And so there's much more generalization of understanding of operations. So there, they do have an advantage in that regard, but the capital requirements are killer. And so the idea is, I suggest that you don't look at just it three, five, but you look at seven and 10 year relationships. And 
the one thing I've coached everybody who I talk to, and this is regardless of size, is make sure that you have volume adjustment that allows you to go down when the cost, when your, when your scale goes down. So if you have to reduce the number of beds, then your monthly uh, fixed fee will go down. But fixed fee is the only way for somebody to manage that. And they have to make partnership with somebody else in a larger system to get the technical expertise that they need. And as you pointed out, it doesn't matter what size your organization, the regulations don't say, if you're this size, you get to do this little security. You know, like everything is going to be the same quality as the same expectations in your, of, your, of your patients are the same. So you, you really have to have a long-term partnership. And there are vendors out there, and I won't mention them, but there are vendors who make special allowances to support the rural communities. And so those are the community, those are the partners I would seek out first. Sue, rural healthcare, what, what, how'd you coach a CIO there? I'll give three points. One, you've already mentioned, Bill, and saying it's a lonely job. There's lots of resources to network with and learn from even though you may feel like you're the only one doing this and you're isolated as a CIO. Secondly, so take advantage of that. Secondly, if there are talks, if it's not going to be an independent rural community hospital, part of some merger activity, don't view that as a threat, but view that as an opportunity for you and your team. And, and lastly, with the positive nature of work from home, that greatly expands the talent pool for people who are trying to hire in small, more isolated areas, because you can hire people elsewhere that are going to be on your team virtually. So I think that could be a real positive opportunity. Fantastic. As always, you guys do not disappoint. If people wanted to get in touch with you around coaching, around the work that Starbridge does, so many different areas, security, interim leadership, ERP and whatnot, how would they get it? How would they get in touch with you? Check out our website, starbridgeadvisors.com. We've got a blog there. I've got a blog, sueshade.com. Reach out to us on LinkedIn. You can follow me on Twitter, sgshade is my handle. David? Oh, yeah, it's at David Muntz is my Twitter handle. And by the way, our email addresses are easy. It's firstname.lastname at starbridgeadvisors.com. Happy to, and by the way, Shade, it's S-C-H-A-D-E. Uh, yes. So. Absolutely. Hey, thanks again for, for coming on the show. I think this is, again, invaluable. I was telling you guys earlier that one of your shows that was six months old got a huge spike. And I, I, I think it, it speaks to the value of it. I think I, I'm speculating that a college professor essentially is saying, hey, or potentially a master's program is saying, hey, listen to this. There's a lot of great information in this because that doesn't usually happen. You don't usually have a big uptick six months after a podcast goes live. So I, I think that speaks to your experience and your wisdom. So you started by praising the show. I'm returning the favor and I really appreciate your wisdom and the work that you're doing in, the, in healthcare. So thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you, Bill. Thanks so much, Bill. That's all for this week. Don't forget to sign up for Clip Notes. Send an email, hit the website. We want to make you and your system more productive. Special thanks to our channel sponsors, VMware, Starbridge Advisors, Galen Healthcare, Health Lyrics, Sirius Healthcare, Pro Talent Advisors, Health Next, and McAfee for choosing to invest in developing the next generation of health leaders. This show is a production of This Week in Health IT. For more great content, check out the website, but also check out our YouTube channel. Continue to make adjustments there. Thanks for your feedback on that, and we hope we, to make that a great resource for you. Uh, if you want to support the show, best way to do that, share it with a peer. Participate in the in the Clip Notes referral program. That's another great way to do it. Please check back every Monday. No, I'm sorry, not Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday as we continue to drop shows. Thanks for listening. That's all for now. <laughs>